So today we're going to talk about fibroids and endometriosis. I want to thank Ms. Daniels for inviting me, and certainly I want to thank everybody here for coming out in this horrible weather. So, next slide. Fibroids. Fibroids have a number of names. They're called fibroids, they're called lyomyomas, they're called fibromas. What are they? They are basically just benign tumors that are made out of the smooth muscle cells and the fibrous tissue that develop in the uterus. It's estimated that about 20 to 50 percent of women of reproductive age across the country have them, most of which are undiagnosed simply because of the location and may not be appreciated on pelvic exam. So what causes them? It's unknown. It's felt that the tumor develops from an abnormal muscle cell, which in under the fluence of estrogen just grows astronomically. There is a question as to whether there is a genetic association, because they tend to run in families. Um, and so there is definitely a genetic association there. So who's at risk? Next slide. People that look like me all of us in the room. Um, black women seem to be the individuals that are most at risk for developing fibroids, and no one knows why that, that is. Other things that cause you to be at risk, being in, no, 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 no. No, back. Okay, right there. Other things that cause you to be at risk, being in the perimenopausal, um, arena, uh, having obesity, and certainly there seems to be an association with your diet. If you're consuming a lot of red meat, eating a lot of fatty foods, that seems to put you at an increased risk of developing fibroids. So the bottom line with this is the majority, in the majority of risks, there seems to be a long-term exposure to high, level of, high levels of estrogen. When you're obese, you are making estrogen in that fatty tissue in addition to your ovaries. So you're basically making a, an overabundance of estrogen, which the fibroids love. Um, and also when you have this overabundance of estrogen, not only are you at an increased risk of developing fibroids, but you're also at an increased risk of developing endometrial cancer. So I'm not going to steal Dr. Uh, the other doctor that's going to be talking today about cancers in women. So we'll move on from there. Next slide. So there are different types of fibroids depending on where they're located. You have the pedunculated fibroid, which is a fibroid that is, sits on a little stalk. You have, an, <coughs> excuse me, an intracavitary fibroid, which is a fibroid that kind of sits in the lining of your uterus. You have subserosal fibroids, which are basically right under the skin of the uterus. You have an intramural fibroid, which is sits right into the uh, wall of the uh, uterus, and then you have your submucosal fibroids, which is right underneath the lining on, of the inside of the uterus. Next slide. Now, most women with fibroids are asymptomatic. You become symptomatic depending on where the fibroid is located and the size of the fibroid. Um, symptoms can be mild or they can be debilitating. Some of the common symptoms that you see, feeling of pressure, heavy, heavy periods, problems with defecation, um, painful sex, infertility. So those are some of the more common problems that you can see. Next slide. So how do we diagnose them? Most fibroids are diagnosed via a simple uh, pelvic exam. Uh, when you go to the gynecologist, you know, she's going to do a bimanual exam on you to see whether or not there's any feelings of tumors, any nodularity, so forth and so on. Other modalities that can be used, x-ray, ultrasound, uh, MRIs or magnetic resonant imaging, 
hysterosalpingogram. Hysterosalpingogram is um, a technique whereby dye is injected into the uterine cavity and with an x-ray it kind of gives you a visual of what's going on, not only of the inside of the uterine cavity but also in the fallopian tube. So if you have a fibroid that's sitting right at the entrance of the fallopian tube that may explain why you've been unable to get pregnant. Um, and hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is an operative procedure where basically um, a little scope is placed inside of the uterus and the doctor can directly look on the inside of the uterus to see whether or not you have an intracavitary myoma or whether there are other things that are going on that are blocking your tubes or causing you to have issues. Um, next slide. So, what treatment options do we have? Well, generally when you have fibroids, depending on where they are, your doctor is going to start you off with medications that will help to alleviate some of the pain that is associated with them. So you'll likely get uh, ibuprofen or a leave uh, to kind of decrease those symptoms, particularly when you're having your menstruation. Other um, medical options are something that's known as GNRH, agonist, long and short of them, that is a medication which basically decreases the estrogen concentration in your body, and since fibroids love estrogen, what's going to happen is they're going to shrink, and it does kind of induce uh, an artificial menopause, so we kind of leave that as a last resort. You can have conservative uh, surgical therapy. Uh, where basically the fibroid in and of itself is removed. That's called a myomectomy. And that's particularly offered to women who want to preserve their fertility and, and have children. Uh, there's another procedure called um, uterine artery embolization, where basically uh, a particular agent is injected into the vessels which feed the fibroid. And so by decreasing that blood flow there, basically the fibroids outgrow their blood supply and they kind of die off and shrink. So those are some of the conservative surgical therapies. Therapeutic surgical therapy, as everybody knows, is a hysterectomy. You can just remove the fibroid, uh, remove the uterus if the fibroid has grown to the extent where it's causing sufficient problems and the woman does not want to have any more children. She's reached the end of her childbearing. Uh, next slide. So now we're going to shift gears. I'm going to talk to you about endometriosis. Next slide. No, no, you've really gone back again. Back again. Back again. And again. Okay, there it is. All right, so endometriosis, what is it? Endometriosis is a medical condition basically in which the tissue which lines the inside of your uterus actually goes outside of the uterus and implants in other parts of your body. Most commonly, it's going to implant in your abdominal cavity. However, there have been instances where it goes wherever it wants. It can go in your lungs, it can go in your brain, it can go in your eyes, it can go in your skin, it can go into any type of scar that you have. About 11% of all US women of uh, childbearing age um, have this particular um, condition. So what are your risks? Next slide. Your risks are women who have never had children, strong family history, prolonged menstrual periods where you're bleeding more than seven days, medical conditions which block the flow of menstrual blood, diet, again, has been associated with endometriosis where you're consuming a lot of fatty foods and meats. Causes, nobody knows. Several theories, like I said, retrograde menstruation, where instead of your uterine lining sloughing and coming out of the vagina, it goes back upwards, comes out through the tubes, and implants itself in your abdominal um, cavity. Um, 
genetic factors can be considered, particularly, again, if, if there are multiple members of your family that have the condition, it points to a genetic link. Other issues, you may have an abnormal immune system. Again, um, no one really knows why this may occur, but there is an association with an abnormal immune system such that once the endometrial implants in other parts of your body, your body doesn't recognize that as foreign and it doesn't destroy or kill it. It just kind of leaves it alone and so that uterine tissue just kind of goes and does whatever it wants to do. Hormonal dysfunction. There seems to be an association with the high estrogen concentration in the body. Again, no particular specifics as to what that is. And then there's uterine instrumentation. So women who have had uterine in instrumentation, say if they've had a C-section, if they've had a myomectomy, if they've had an elective termination of pregnancy, anything that kind of disrupts the uterine uh, integrity puts you at risk for um, this particular um, issue. Next slide. So what are the symptoms? Pain. Pain, 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 pain. That is the most common presenting system, symptom of women that have endometriosis. And the pain can present itself as excruciating periods where you, you just are in the bed. It's so painful, you just can't even get out of bed, go to work. It disrupts your daily activity um, of living. You can have painful sex. You can have this chronic pelvic pain that is debilitating. And it can also affect when you have to go to the bathroom having bowel movement. The bowel movement process is excruciating. There are issues with infertility for whatever reason. Um, it's unknown why it specifically affects fertility. It's felt that the endometriosis in and of itself puts out chemicals which basically uh, kill the sperm. So the egg and the sperm never meet because the chemicals within the endometrial implants just basically kind of kill the sperm. You can have intestinal dysfunction where you're having diarrhea or very painful constipation, nausea and vomiting that can occur with um, the endometriosis. Um, and you can have scarring. The scarring can occur due to the endometrial implants, which I'll show you shortly. Next slide. So how do we diagnose it? Again, pelvic exam. On pelvic exam, you may feel some nodularity of the uterus and the adnexa, which would lend one to suspect that this woman may have endometriosis. On ultrasound, that's another modality. What you'll see, um, you may see a lot of masses within the abdomen, um, and particularly on the ovaries. You can do an MRI which will give you a 2D image of the internal organs and that can give you a lot of information as to whatever pathology is going on. But the gold standard is hysteroscopy. And hysteroscopy is a surgical procedure whereby a scope is placed on the inside of your abdomen so the surgeon can actually just kind of take a look and see what's going on. So these pictures that are, that are here show you basically what is seen. So in the first um, picture, what you, this little chocolate thing right here. This is an ovary that's covered in an endometrial implant. So it's called a chocolate cyst because it's a cyst and it looks like just chocolate ball. But that's endometriosis. The second thing here, this is the uterus, these are the tubes, and these are the two ovaries right here. Oftentimes when we go in and do an, a hysteroscopic evaluation, what you'll see are your ovaries that are kind of enlarged and just right next to each other, and we call it kissing ovaries. And then the third thing that we see here is, you see all this filmy stuff? This should not be here. So this is all endometriosis, which is just basically bundled and, and captured the uterus and tubes together. So now when we do a diagnostic laparoscopy such as this, it gives you a, an opportunity to not only see where these endometrial implants are, but it also gives you an opportunity to grade or stage how badly the disease has affected you internally. 
Stage one is, you know, minimal uh, implants. Stage four, which would probably look like that, where basically all of your organs are bound together. And uh, that is problematic and certainly painful. Next slide. So treatment. What can we give for women that are suffering from endometriosis? Well, again, like in fibroids, we kind of start out with pain meds, non-steroidals like ibuprofen or Aleve, and basically what that does is it augments, um, it augments certain chemicals which decrease the inflammation that's associated with endometriosis. It blocks that inflammatory process. Birth control pills, since endometriosis may be hormonally mediated by giving you birth control pills, that kind of gets your hormonal levels equitable such that it decreases the symptoms. GnRH agonists, again, those are agonists which can induce an artificial um, menopause by decreasing the amount of estrogen that's, uh, that's produced. Surgical, like I said, the hysteroscopy, uh, where the physician goes in and actually sees those implants, they can use a laser to kind of laser them and destroy everything that they see that is abnormal. Um, there are a lot of women that, uh, when they are seeking care, opt for, initially, holistic medication, and, and I'm a big proponent in kind of a naturopathic approach. So there are some things that I usually tell my patients who do have this condition to try before we go to the more uh, severe uh, treatment options. And one of the things that I, I ask them is, what's your diet like? Are you eating a lot of red meat? Are you eating a lot of fatty foods? So you, you need to cut that out. Increase your vegetables. Um, incorporate plant seeds, like flax seeds, into your diet. And what flax seeds do is they contain something called flavones, which decrease the amount of estrogen that is in the body. So that's a natural way to do things. Vegetables which do this are broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, all the things that we eat anyway. Um, the other thing is increase your omega-3 consumption. You can do that by eating a lot of salmon and anchovies uh, and sardines. Try and decrease your stress. Stress is associated with uh, exacerbating your uh, endometriosis symptoms. There's certain herbal remedies. There's one in particular called ashwagandha, which is an Indian type of ginseng. And what that does is it boosts the immune system. Ginger tea decreases a lot of the intestinal symptoms that are associated with endometriosis. And vitamins such as vitamin B and C are felt to be helpful as far as a holistic manner of, of treating it. So, next slide. So, in conclusion, let's talk about the take home message. There are a lot of things both internally and externally which can impact the health of the uterus and ultimately your health, your fertility, your sexuality, and general well-being. I'm a firm believer that knowledge is power and I hope that I have shared information with you all which will empower you toward excellent health. So with that, I thank you. Take questions.